<laughs> How are you? I'm good. It's a beautiful sunny day. I know. We're a little spoiled right now. Yeah. No, this is like perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done a podcast with this type of view. <laughs> it's kind of remarkable. <laughs> Conversation might go not go so far. It's a little like, distracting. Yeah, I know. This is how this is what it's like. Okay. <laughs> um, why don't we start out with you telling the listeners who you are and what you do? Um, my name is Priya Shah. I'm the founder and executive director of a nonprofit called The Simple Good. And so our mission is to connect the meaning of good from around the world to empower youth to become positive activists through art and discussion. So what that means is we provide social emotional learning based arts residency programs to different schools and nonprofits, all challenging our students to find their meaning of the simple good within their lives, within themselves, around the world, in order to use that as a means to funnel positive change into the community. So what we're trying to really teach is that everything that you really need for change is already within you and understanding how to identify that, express it, and then actually apply it into our lives. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot. Yes. Um, before I go further, that's amazing, and thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. This world needs more people like yourself. Thank you. Um, now let's reverse engineer that. Yeah. How do you get to that? How, where does that come from? Where does that drive to go outside of yourself, to help people, to inspire the youth, children, and even adults, because sometimes adults get inspired when they see kids being inspired. So yeah. where does that come from for you? Um, it's been a life's journey um, and definitely a life's work. I think I got you know the initial understanding that if you have the means to help people, you should do it, right? And that was something that was taught by my mother. And what really opened my eyes up to the even understanding of what res it means to learn and teach resilience was my travels. I traveled all over the world. I did international volunteer work at Mother Teresa's Orphanage, and I was in Africa and India and Brazil and all the places mm. at a pretty young age and got very much exposed to different walks of life, but also different means of resilience and how folks overcome. And, you know, as a kid, you're always thinking that your struggles are just you. And that's what a lot of us as humans in general do. But when you see you know, the vastness of the human experience and also our capacity to overcome and create beautiful things, it really inspired me to realize, like, what am I complaining about, right? Yeah, and right. how can I use the gifts and assets that I've already born with to create the life that I want to live, right? And I thought that that whole thought profoundly changed, you know, how I operated, how I saw my identity, and it made me really passionate about teaching other kids that were just like me that were written off as a child because of how I looked or what I was um, and just teach that to more folks like you know and it's coming back to that idea that if you have the means to give you should do that and that actually is what you know makes life worth living mm -hmm. and to me the means to give is am I breathing and alive and I could think mm. that means I could do something right mm -hmm. yes. um, so how old were you when you first went abroad to different countries? Um, I traveled as a child, but I think the first moment that I traveled on my own and had these understandings was when I was in high school. Okay. Um, I did um, a volunteer trip to India, and we worked at different orphanages, including Mother Teresa's Orphanage. And I think the most powerful part was when I was going away by myself, right, not through the protection of your family or your parents, and two, I was in a space that I was always shunned away from being around. You know, you're, in general, you're not really encouraged to be by poverty or helping poverty because we live in a classist world. Yeah. Even if you don't even have that many means, we didn't grow up with that much, but still there's this mentality of separating yourself from struggle. And when I broke that barrier and boundary, it like really made me realize about what our capacity to really support each other is and also how much we receive by you know, supporting each other. All mm -hmm. those experiences, I'm the one probably took more away than I actually gave and has led me to do the work that I do now. And it just changed how I thought as a kid. It changed my goals as even studying, going to university. You know, it just changed how I even operated and decided to navigate the world. So I really think that, you know, travel is very important, you know, at a very young age, but just in general, Traveling to places that are outside of your comfort zone mm -hmm. is something that should be encouraged, you know, at a younger age so we can understand different walks of life and how we all navigate this earth. I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. I, I'm envious of those who've been able to travel far and wide, especially at a young age. 
I had a the opposite experience. I, I didn't travel a lot because my parents didn't come from um, means to do that, but we camped a lot and we road tripped a lot, but mostly in Chicago. I'm from here. My family is from here. My parents showed me a lot of the poverty here. Mm. We did a lot of charity work here growing up through on their own or through youth groups. So I saw maybe not the type of third world poverty you were exposed to in India and Africa, which is a, completely different, but seeing the poverty here, the the unhoused here, homeless here, and feeding and bringing food and clothes and cans to those different establishments, Pacific Garden Mission, um, things like that. So I saw that at a young age too. And my parents had us go to these um, apartment complexes, Section 8 homes, and bring food and clothes to them. But we had to do it on the holidays. So before we were allowed to open up our gifts, that we were given, we had to go at like eight in the morning to very uh, dangerous neighborhoods in Chicago and like help people. And at the time I hated it because mm. you're like eight years old <laughs> yeah. and like, I want to play with the new Hot Wheels, yeah. new N64 or something, right? Mm-hmm. But in hindsight, it was probably the best thing they've ever done for me. That's amazing. So yeah, I, I've always wanted to go to other countries too, but to hear you say that, it's like, I never got to do that, but I, I had it here. Mm-hmm. And I, I wish more people were exposed to that. Just be aware of like how unfortunate and to be honest, bad it can be for others when you complain about something, when your iPhone dies and you're going to wait <laughs> for the new update or something, know. you know, or yeah. it's hot out, just things like that. Like we have clean water yes. and it's here. Um, but you, you started to get into charity work in high school. You went to, where did you go to college and how did it go on from that point? Yeah, I ended up going to U of I in mm-hmm. Champaign and I studied accounting and finance, which was the complete <laughs> opposite trajectory that everybody was expecting me to do because I grew up as an artist. You know, I was very much into community work. What kind and, of art? Um, so I'm a visual artist. I do painting and mixed media drawing. I used to do a lot of charcoal work. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and poetry really influenced my work too. Mm. Um, And I was always about the intersection of all the different mediums of art and displaying Mm -hmm. that through my paintings. And in the Chicagoland area you're from? Mm -hmm. I grew up in Oak Park. Oh, okay. Um, Not too far from there. Oh, yeah. No, totally. I mean, I think it was such a unique opportunity to grow up there because it was such a diverse community that gave you and encouraged you to connect to many different cultures, right? And it was normalized in our community to be friends with everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and so going into college, I was a bit shocked about like how segregated the world actually is, you know? And I was one of the few people on campus that hung out with everybody. And I was like stigmatized for that, you know? And I didn't realize like the barriers until college, which was really crazy. Most people already know that, you know? Mm-hmm. And I was in my little diversity bubble growing up and mm-hmm. I didn't realize that was a thing. However, that did really formulate, you know, how I saw the world and how I felt comfortable and connected to everybody, which most people don't, right? And that's why we separate ourselves from each other because we're not actually exposed and growing up with around each other. So we don't feel like we're a part of each other's community. Mm-hmm. And it really takes, that's why I always say, like you have to step out of your comfort zone at a young age in order to realize how you are really connected to everyone. And we are all the same. We might, and we, we all have come different, we come with different gifts with however we may look like or born into this world. And those gifts are like points of wisdom that we can learn from each other. And I think like, I realized that, you know, through these travels of like, wow, people are incredible assets to each other. We need to learn from each other, right? And that's why I just would always listen. I've always been in this space of listening and learning. And that's what allowed me to learn a lot about the world just through, you know, conversation with my travels. Um, But I did go into the business route after seeing ga- the gap between business and social sector all around the world. You know, oh, I was doing okay. all this awesome work, you know, doing social impact, but none of them were always sustainable, right? Because these were, you needed support of investment and business in order to keep things going. And these were two groups of people that need to talk to each other, but they speak different languages because of the two different worlds they're a part of. And I realized how much of a uh, privilege it is to go to university. You know, in America, it's like an assumption that you'll go Mm -hmm. in most neighborhoods, not all. But I was was just so, um, so, like, eye-open to the amount of privilege that I have and how I should take advantage of it. And so I ended up going into the business route, and I knew that one day I was going to learn from this and take it back to the communities I used to work with and hopefully create that sustainable change. 
And what ended up happening was I did accounting and finance. Everybody was shocked that I was there. Like, what are you doing? Why aren't you in art school? Were you shocked? Uh, I kind of. When I sat in my first accounting class, I was like, oh, my God. Why am I doing this? <laughs> People like this stuff. <laughs> did you continue to make art while doing that? I did, actually. Yeah, I was making different paintings. I had my first art exhibition at U of I, actually. Oh, nice. Yeah, and I curated a show called Eyes of India to show the multi-pluralism of the Indian identity. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was like the first time I was actually in space with a lot of other South Asians. I didn't grow up with that. So, your, your parents are from there? Yeah, my, okay. both of my parents are Indian, but in our community, we didn't have that many. So okay. college was like the first time that I got to actually be friends with a lot of different types of South Asians. And even my travels in India, I was just really... Um, amazed by India because you can learn about the entire world within that small subcontinent. It's such a history. It's a main, like one of the biggest places I want to go to by far. You have to go. Right. You the lit- food, I lo- <laughs> probably my favorite cuisine. My yeah. It's so amazing. <laughs> and the music, the history, mm-hmm. the religions, the, the thoughts, the, mm-hmm. the wisdom, it's remarkable. Yeah, the wisdom is insane. And I feel like I just got so much understanding of like world, the world and people and um, just reflected a lot while I was there and it, I just wanted to share that wisdom with everybody and I think that's also what guides me even now when I learn about ancient cultures and how we actually all actually have the answers of a lot of the questions that we're seeking, right? Mm-hmm. Like all of this has happened before and right. <laughs> we need to actually look back and realize, you know, how we can actually evolve and do better just by learning from the past. We're not that unique. We're not that, yeah, no, we aren't. Like everything literally that is happening now <laughs> has happened before. <laughs> In some iteration. Yeah. But regardless, you're born, you live, and you pass away. Mm-hmm. And like, that's the one common thing that every human has. It's what do we do in that window? Whatever it is, it could be sadly one day or it could be 120 years. Mm-hmm. Hopefully 150 soon. Yes. And. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's just kind of remarkable what you can learn from listening, what you can learn from just keeping your eyes open, mm-hmm. from holding back your opinion and, and weighing it against what you actually experience, what mm-hmm. you see, instead of just jumping to a conclusion. Yeah, um, The world is huge. It's small now because of technology, but it's it's massive. Mm-hmm. There's not just one way to live or think. Yeah. You know, it's so I'm sure going to India and going to Africa, you said you went to Brazil as well. Mm-hmm. It's just everywhere. Turkey huh? and Turkey. Korea. And, yeah. So just all places. the continents yeah. besides Antarctica. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I'm going to go to Antarctica. <laughs> I don't like, the, I don't like the cold. Those penguins look really scary. <laughs> <laughs> like, why would anyone go there? <laughs> you can do the simple good there, you know? Yeah. You know, <laughs> penguins aren't my clientele. I would say, so I'm just going to. <laughs> one of the things in life I'm not looking to achieve. That's all. <laughs> There's many things I am looking to, but that's not one of them. <laughs> what are some of the things? Uh, well, the goal, larger goal for Simple Good is to really grow our work globally and yeah. really facilitate cross-cultural dialogue through the arts with uh, with all our programs. So when we used to do work in East Africa, I would bring our students artwork from Chicago to our students in East Africa and share you know, their Simple Goods, their artwork, And we would have reciprocal dialogue of what is happening in each other's worlds and societies. And the students just are so fascinated about learning about each other and also realizing, wow, I'm not the only one going through something. Mm -hmm. I'm also not the only one surviving. You know, there's so many different examples of resilience that's happening even within my age. And that allows our students to transform and really reflect, well, how am I making an impact on my community? And also creating a connection of something beyond their own, Mm -hmm. right? At the end of every exchange that we've done, our students have been able to feel like they can go to London or they can go to Uganda or they want to go to Rwanda now like and they feel connected to a place and vice versa our students in Africa want to come to Chicago we did an exchange in Croatia and they felt like they connect to Chicago you know what I mean Mm -hmm. like and it's such a beautiful simple thing that we can do for each other that facilitates peaceful harmonious communities and consideration of each other's identity when we make decisions now Mm -hmm. you know and I think those types of connections need to be had at a younger age and I mean I'm also impacted from it I traveled everywhere I met so many different types of people at a young age and now they are also a part of my identity right and so I'm considering everybody's walk of life as I navigate the organization or even whatever I do right because now I feel connected to something that 
once was beyond me, but now it's a part of me. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, that's what I hope to see in the world is just understanding it's really not that hard to connect to each other if we no, really want to. It's not. We're open to it. Yeah. And like, it's just so vital for us to do that in education as we learn all these other skill sets to really build empathy for each other. I always call it like I'm building institutional empathy within these institutions that we have in every community, empathy has to be the cornerstone of learning anything because mm -hmm. that's how you understand the nuances of history, of math, of anything that's created is when you have empathy for people's different ways of life. Right. So, well, you've gotten to this point now, but so you're in college and you get out of college. What do you, what do, you do next? How do you get to where you are now, like what are the next? This probably 10, 12, 15 years ago. If I, yeah, I don't know, we don't need to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're not talking about that, but you know what I'm saying? Like, time's gone by, you have all this knowledge and experience now. When, how, what's the next step after college? So, um, surprisingly, I went to corporate accounting right after I graduated. <laughs> I worked at a big four accounting firm, and it was. It was, uh, you know, I went into that path intentionally, though, because I really wanted to learn, like, corporate business, right? How is this entity and this world navigating to create sustainable infrastructures, right, that's really yeah. profitable and it's really um, taking control a lot of, about, of community impact almost, right? You're creating a machine that is moving towards one agenda. And I wanted to understand that machine so I could move it towards a community agenda, mm -hmm. right? So I was going in there and not really understanding what auditing is, and I quickly found out, and I was like, this is not for me. However, mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to learn about, like, how do all these businesses function? You know, what are the soft skills and hard skills that you need to know in order to create something sustainable? Like, you can always have an idea, but if you don't have the infrastructure to actually build out that idea, it's not going to go very far. Yeah. And so I actually started The Simple Good on the side while I was at the firm, and it was just something I needed. I knew I wanted to do already, but it, I needed a creative outlet too. <laughs> I, could not, I could not just do numbers. Yeah. And um, it was just something that, like, I was taking in with everything that I was learning from work. I was also applying to this concept, and that's what started building like the small infrastructure of what we have today. And that phrase is simple, good. This is gonna sound corny. It's so <laughs> simple, but it's so good. Yeah. <laughs> because. A lot of individuals want to do something big in life. They want to change things. But it has to start from a simple place, mm -hmm. like your own self, being happy, being mm -hmm. grateful, finding out what makes life work for you and those around you, those you love. So that simple phrase, it, I think it goes miles, magnitudes, mm -hmm. you know, above what it, how simple it is, mm -hmm. you know, which is great. And it's also easy for kids to digest mm -hmm. and anybody from any age. It, it's not so sophisticated in a way that's not good. It's just, it's simple enough to keep hope alive, you know? So mm -hmm. where did that phrase come from? It was really inspired by our travels. Like it was actually birthed from a conversation with friends who also traveled a lot and um, just reflecting on, you know, no matter where you went in the world, it was these small moments that really bring you joy mm -hmm. and calm and peace, right? Like, Whenever you travel anywhere, you're taking pictures of the same thing. It's always a sunrise, a sunset, a kind act, something that somebody's smiling, something, you know, a piece of nature. These elements of beauty are all the same to us, and they trigger a very small, simple emotion that evokes positivity. And those are the simple goods that actually do create humanity. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, we were talking, and I had a bunch of photos. My friends had photos, and we were like, let's just start a blog and put it all together and ask other folks to share their simple good and try to create some conversation around it, not knowing what to expect, but just like wanting to amplify the dialogue. And um, yeah, we started with 54 photos and put in a simple little blog when that was like popular back then. Mm -hmm. And then it just went viral. Like we got so many submissions all over the world um, within only a matter of a week. Wow. And it was so beautiful, the stories that people would share, even though they might be super simple, but then the photos captured something more or it would be vice versa. Yeah. And I think what that really taught me was that people are willing to be vulnerable with each other just to feel connected. Like there's so many folks that wrote, they're like, I spent hours on your blog just like 
wanting, you know, wanting to learn about others and these small moments of connection were just so powerful. And I wanted it to not be a digital thing. I wanted it to be an in-person where human beings actually connect around it. And so that's what led to me doing our first actual photo exhibition in Chicago where I featured the 20 most popular photos on the blog. And in order to get into the exhibition, you had to bring in your own photo, The Simple Good. And then I, we put it, I put it on the walls with the other photos in order to really show dialogue of, you know, all of us is connected to it. And people can actually see everyone's life experiences within one room. And it was such a fascinating social experiment because it was like 100 people within a room that didn't know what this meant. So what is a simple good, right? What, mm -hmm. a photograph what are we doing? And in the beginning, it was like really quiet and chill. By the end, the noise level was like through the roof. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I think it worked. <laughs> and um, yeah, everyone's like, what are you going to do next? And I knew I wanted to bring it to children, especially children in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I'm from Chicago and I would be doing all this work all over the world. And I just realized that, you know, the same things that I was working with, with kids around the world, the same things happening in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And you're just stigmatized as being negative because of what you look like or where you're born. And I wanted our students to really share their simple good. And so um, my approach to a few teachers on the South Side, I'm like, yo, I have this blog. I want your students to be a part of it. I'll buy the art supplies. I'll pay for the exhibition. What are your thoughts? <laughs> and they were so excited. They're like, yes, like kids are talking about too much negativity. We need like positive, positive dialogue. And that's kind of the birth of the first pilot program that we did. Um, and that was just like so eye opening and life changing because these kids were, you know, really repeating things that you hear in your environment. We all do. We just take in our environment and, you know, embody that. And a lot of it was negative. Right. And by exposing them to different examples of positivity through the photography blog, through different activities, you can see that they were started embodying the positivity that we were teaching and also observing that in their environment. So like when we'd come back to class the next day, we'd start out a few sessions saying, okay, what was your simple good of today? And a student would be like, I saw a homeless per somebody give a homeless person $5 instead of $1. And so to have that like really specific observation of something positive in a community that was previously they viewed as negative yeah. shifts how now they're accountable to the community, how they see it and what their potential could be, you know? And it's really about us seeking out good things in our lives in order for us to make good decisions that lead to our future. And that was like a prime example of like how it really should work. And it was so powerful. The, the principal like invited us back every year. And it, from there, the program just kept on growing. Wow, yeah. that's remarkable. Yeah. So you, how many years have you, have you been doing that? So we've been doing programming for eight years now. Wow. Yeah, I founded it 10 years ago. It could have been nine years ago. I don't know, time is flying. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I just realized, I'm like, 10 years is simple, good, what? Yeah, so it's been a while. You gotta have a, par you gotta have a party. <laughs> I know, well, City of Big Dreams, September 29th, that is gonna be our big celebration. That's so, awesome. Yes. Wow, that's so. You've been working with and interfacing with kids and artists and mm -hmm. schools for the last ten years in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. I know the answer to this, but does it ever get overwhelming? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> what What do you do? Uh, I think yeah, I sit in gratitude. Right, I'm able to bring this one idea in t and manifest it into the great capacity that it is today. And I'm just like so grateful. You know, there's the fact that the world has received it and has embodied it and is also pushing it forward with me mm -hmm. is just a blessing. And I'm just like very excited to see how far we can go mm -hmm. and what um, trajectories we can change together. You know, this isn't, I'm just the person that brought it into the world, but this is everybody's organization and it should be, right? And right. Um, we need the entire community, the global community, to really express and understand the symbol goods in our lives for us to understand the peace within ourselves in order to really provoke peace in our communities. You know, mm -hmm. we can't, I don't really like when people talk about violence in Chicago or any communities like, oh, that community's violent, blah, blah, blah. But honestly, a lot of our communities are violent. We just see them in different ways because a lot of people are not in peace with themselves, right? Right. And so we're not really being the best people that we can be mm -hmm. because we haven't figured that out. And so that is why we need everybody to be really supporting, evoking this within each other. 
I couldn't agree more. And that's what drives me crazy because there's <laughs> so much money and resources and the infrastructure is there. I, what is going on? Well, why, like, why is it we could look outside this window? Mm-hmm. This is remarkable. Yeah. But this is the west side of Chicago we're looking at. Mm-hmm. You just go a few miles that way and you know exactly what I'm talking about, what mm-hmm. you'll see. Why, why is there some, like, how is this happening right underneath our nose? Yeah. We, we're aware of it, not just you and I, society is. Governments are, federal, state, and local, and yet it still happens. And I'm trying, I'm personally trying to do something about it. I know you are, but like, based on your experience, why does it keep happening? Why does it keep being propelled forward like this? I think there's, it's a effect of otherism. We other, other human beings. And thing, and it's literally a tactical methodology that can be provoked through language, through propaganda, through laws, right? That you are othering other humans to put them in a position where they're no longer human. Mm-hmm. So therefore, you don't feel connected to them, and you're okay if something negative happens to them because now you feel like it's not connected to you. So as a human being, if you stare, it's proven. If you stare in anybody's eyes for three seconds, you're automatically connected to them. Therefore, yes, if I hit you, I'm going to feel bad about it, right? I love how you said that as soon as I start staring in your eyes. Yeah. I'm going to hit you. Yeah, then I'll be like, oh, no. You know, that that's a very natural like reaction that happens within all of us. And... When you prevent those types of connections from happening, any type of violence or inhumane treatment Mm -hmm. is like separated from you. So we think it's okay. The problem is, is that it's not okay and it leads to these divisions and systems. And that's why we really do have to integrate into each other's communities and understand that we are actually all very much connected. And if one side of the city suffers, then so will ours. And the problem is, is that these systems that separate us also lead to money being separated. Yeah. So until we can get integrated with each other, we're not going to really campaign for investment in each other's communities. We're going to campaign investment of our own community. If our own community incorporates everybody, then everybody gets that investment. The problem is, is that everybody doesn't look at their community, including everybody. And so that's why we have to teach this at a younger age. You know, I do adult workshops with our programs, uh, teaching social emotional learning through the arts, teaching DI work. And what ends up happening is that, you know, they're all trying to figure out how do I become more inclusive? Well, the real thing is, is that you can't until you figure out the identities that are within yourself. And once you do that, you can understand how to connect to other people, no matter what their race is. Mm -hmm. But we are looking at it in a very superficial lens that doesn't unpack who we are. So how are we going to connect to other human beings? And we're not taught who we are. And so therefore, we just follow. Like, yep, I'm going to follow, live in a place where everybody looks like me because I still don't know who I am. Hmm. Now, if you have some groundedness and sense of who you are, then you have the ability, it's a very natural human ability to connect to everybody. And if you look at the history of the world, that is actually the natural migration of people. People are meant to integrate and coexist. And in any community around the world where that has happened, you'll see those are the most vibrant cities. So if you look at port cities around the world, cities where there's been a lot of trade and boats and um, infrastructure and economy, where people come from all around the world just to trade, those are the most vibrant. So think of New Orleans, look at Bahia, Brazil, Cape Town, South Africa. These are all mixtures of different religions, cultures, languages, and it becomes this colorful, vibrant, beautiful community full of music, art, and culture. Mm -hmm. And those that don't don't have that air in the middle of the cornfields. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like it's a limited, it's a limited celebration going on. You know what I mean? Absolutely, <laughs> I completely understand. I, I'm born and raised here, and I enrich myself into Chicago and people from all over the world. And but I have family that live out in the middle of nowhere, and I when I go to visit them for holidays, I feel so much of my life like sucked away oh. from me oh, no. because it's it's so bland it's the same thing it's so it's simple not in a good way it's simple like it's dull the mm-hmm. culture's rolled off it's been morphed and muffled by the lack of ideas by other people i think of just staying in like a hive mind instead of taking out mm-hmm. taking in other information yeah i don't get it i don't get shutting myself off from people i don't i'm Fortunate enough, I, I've never had that problem. 
I've always found other people actually more interesting than the person who lives down the street. Mm -hmm. I want to know more about what that person's interesting too, but I want to know more about other cultures and people, how we got here, Mm -hmm. how we can help each other, different art, different music, different religion, different cuisine, different fashion, architecture, different sciences. I want to know all about it Mm -hmm. um, because I think it can enrich our lives. And I don't get wanting to be with your race or religion only. Mm -hmm. If that's where you feel comfortable, I don't know, maybe you should rip that band off and try Mm -hmm. something new. Um, But it's just really sad. It's really sad to see how much we can actually do here and it feels like an uphill battle all the time. Yeah. And I'm trying to do something too with what I my organization, but it's just it's daunting when you almost feel like you maybe one or two of you are on the same page and then a lot of people are kind of like, "Well, why are you doing that?" Like I'm trying to move my festival and business here to Chicago to enrich it and and raise money for the community because I can only do so much out in the suburbs. And so many people are like, "Why are you going there? Why would you leave?" It's like because this place doesn't need help. Mm-hmm. Like this is a nice, comfortable suburb. I want to go help people in the city, the artists and musicians that I've come up with, people I've been the thousands that I've worked with over the last 10, 12 years of doing what I do. And I want to do something with this brand, with this identity of the music festival. So that's my goal. And it's remarkable that you do your own thing and, mm-hmm. and you're you're on this track. Um, it's kind of inspiring, honestly. It's why I wanted to talk to you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I wish, not everyone's going to start, you know, a business or non for profit, mm-hmm. you know, but they can participate, they can volunteer, they can donate, they can at least support and share it on social media. Social media. Um, what are some things that you do outside of your organization to keep yourself balanced? And because you work with a lot of kids and to stay balanced and stay like clear headed to not get too wrapped up in that, you still have to be your own self. You still have to be an adult Mm -hmm. and live that life (laughs) and go out and have fun. So like, what are some things you do to stay balanced with all of the stress that's pulling you in these different directions? You're thinking big. So you have that stress trying to, how can I help people and keep this business going while I'm helping people? Mm -hmm. But like you are still an individual. Like how do you keep yourself grounded and sane? Um, I think, you know, just, I'm just really in gratitude, honestly, in like everything, like all the people I meet, I'm always like fascinated by the Mm -hmm. walks of life that I've met and are in my circle and the way that I can learn from them, you know? Um, and I think that really grounds me. It's like, if you're doing something right, you're going to meet people that are very much aligned with that pathway. Yeah. Um, and that's always very humbling and makes me continue to keep going and also see like what the possibilities are. Mm -hmm. Um, I love continuing to travel, you know, that really gives me, piece too of um understanding the world better like every moment you have an opportunity to understand the world better no one knows it all but when you come into spaces even if we'll be a new part of chicago i'm just like wow this place is like yeah i I didn't know this existed this (laughs) is amazing yeah just like opening your eyes to that you know and i seek that out a lot of people may not do that as much as i do but (laughs) i'm like no i need to know be somewhere new you know just Mm -hmm. to like learn about the context and history and I just like love that so much. Um, And yeah, just anything that deals with like a new experience, even if it's in a like a really subtle way. I was telling you earlier, I really enjoy wine and it's not necessarily because, you know, love, love the wine nights, which I do, (laughs) but I love the history behind it, you know, Mm -hmm. and you learn the history of the world through it and how that can manifest into a a taste or a product. And so, yeah. And I think like that is a product of like human labor, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you think about it that way, it makes you appreciate a lot of things that are in front of you. Um, and, you know, like I said, it's all grounded in gratitude of the things that we do have. Absolutely. The two things you said that I really relate to you on are the gratitude and the people you meet. Mm. This very conversation is because of what we've both done that we could reach out, I could reach out to you and you're like, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> it's because of the worlds we've found ourselves in. And it's amazing. I am so grateful for the people I get to talk to and mm. meet. If it's through the university or through a music festival or recording or a podcast or playing music at shows and venues around the city, yeah. the people you meet keep it going. Yes. And definitely. they inspire it and the gratitude. I mean, we're in a little bit in different worlds, but sometimes, you know, 
one out of a hundred, you get something that's a little negative. It kind of hurts. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you know. Yes. And you're just like, <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> you're almost like, I. that makes no sense for yeah. what I'm doing. Like, I can't believe you're even saying that. But like, the internet's a weird place. It is weird. It's weird. mostly in the internet. It's never in person. Mm-hmm. People don't talk like that in person. That's yeah. the bad thing about the internet. It's a problem a lot of people keep bringing up. Like, people can hide behind avatars and fake names. Or sometimes it's just who they are. And they're very rude or outlandish. And that's sad. I wish it wasn't like that. I try not to take that personally. But when you meet people in person, that's why I always say to have serious conversations in person, whether it's romantic or platonic or a friend or family, misunderstanding, Mm -hmm. talk in person. It's so much easier to figure things out. You start to realize there's not as much hate as you thought. Yeah, It was just a misunderstanding or someone wanted to say something different. The context was wrong. Talk in person. You'll get a lot more gratitude. You'll understand each other more. You cannot live with like frustration and hate. Yeah, it's so toxic. I, I've never hated anybody. I never will. I do my best to forgive myself and others mm-hmm. all the time, no matter what happened. Or at least talk about it and have a peaceful parting, if possible. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the people you meet—it's remarkable because mm-hmm. everyone. I think we mentioned it downstairs in the lobby. Everyone wants to be happy. Everyone mm-hmm. wants the same thing, really. Yeah. They might speak a different language, yep. be a different age, but they want to live, be happy, be loved, be with somebody, mm-hmm. have family, enjoy life, have wine. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's the simple things and it's not as complicated <laughs> as we like to think. Yeah. Um, I think we get really busy with modern world and we're hustling and going and going. It's mm-hmm. like, just sit back and Something that I relate to you on when you say the simple good, I always call it the in-between. And I call it like, um, right now we're having a podcast and then you have something to do after this and earlier you were doing something. It's the in-between moments that really what make us. Mm. It's uh, taking a breath. It's waiting in line mm. and thinking about your thoughts. Yeah, It's brushing your teeth before bed alone. It's whatever it is, it's not always work or school or a relationship or a party or mm-hmm. travel. It's like, what are you doing in between those things? That's really where most of your life is. Mm. So you need to like be grateful and think about those moments and yeah. share them even more with people. Yeah. So the simple good and the in between. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> so true too. Because those are the things, those are the times that you observe things that are like out of your ordinary or, you know, that is brings goodness to you. Like, I know so many times I like walk down the street. That's why I was saying I like walking. Mm-hmm. Then take this top observation. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a beautiful plant there. Or wow, I didn't know that mural was there. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of why we have we do that annual street art scavenger hunt because I challenge people to see things that are around them. Mm-hmm. You know, make it a little competitive and a fundraiser. But <laughs> it's it, they every time they're like, wow, I really just don't pay attention to yeah. what's around me and that those are those times that you can have a larger realization and appreciation of what you have mm-hmm. take a step back and breathe yes exactly <sighs> life's too short mm-hmm. yeah how's your coffee it's good <laughs> i'm just like, like waiting yeah. for this to melt <laughs> yeah she like froze it for you i was like you didn't need to do that but i appreciate the this sun is beaming it's like it got steamy they're hitting us maybe i'll do this and then it'll melt <laughs> Yeah. So what have you been doing lately with with the simple good? What are um, some big things you've been doing? So we just had we had a lot. You came to our bull showcase. We, that was fun. Yeah. I was trying not to you know, spy on Alex Caruso. <laughs> I wanted to be like, all right, we need to talk about the Milwaukee Bucks <laughs> and why you got your wrist broken. What's that guy's name who did it? I forget his name. Grayson Allen? Is it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just like, I wanted to be like, Listen, I know some guys. <laughs> We're gonna do something. <laughs> this is Chicago. Do you Let's need go. some? Do you need some help? Let me I know. I know you're like a professional athlete, but can, I can help you right? <laughs> as I'm eating pizza. From <laughs> you're like, I'm watching you. Just let me know. <laughs> uh, that's so funny. That that was really cool. How did how did that happen? How have you been? So connected we were, with the Bulls. Yeah, we were a COVID grant recipient uh, from the Bulls, which is so kind of them, and we were so grateful. And it was really awesome for me. I was super excited because I used to play basketball growing up, and the really? 90s Bulls were, were very near and dear to my heart. Me too. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm like... That's <sighs> awesome. Yeah, so I was very much like grew up loving the Bulls, and basketball was a very um, big part of my life because it really challenged me to break people's assumptions about playing basketball and fighting through a lot of society's doubts and stuff. And it Mm -hmm. made me really realize what it means to like 
fight for something that you care about and, you know, really prove people wrong. What and position were you? I played all the positions. I started at five and then slowly there were girls that came in that were taller than me, <laughs> like significantly. <laughs> You're like, what? So I was like four or five. And then, yeah, my sophomore year, like these six foot three girls. Whoa. And I was just like, what are, okay. Six you foot can, three? What high school did you go to? Oak Park River Forest. We had a... That makes sense. Big basketball program, mm-hmm. yes. And I was like, yep, you can take the lane. That's all yours. That's totally <laughs> fine. So <laughs> I, I grew up playing basketball, too. Oh, yeah. Street and organized, like, yeah. all year round. And we would melt the ice outside with hot water <laughs> and play, like, all winter until it froze again, like, an hour later. But, like, just to play... So, yeah, I'm a big That's fan of basketball. amazing. Yeah, yeah, no, I was obsessed. I left my art identity for basketball, like, for a significant <laughs> period of time. But, I, you know, even when I played, I was like, there's so many similarities between art and basketball. Yes. <laughs> thank you. I was going to say it. You yeah. you literally took the words <laughs> I I always say this to my friends that, because there, there's this weird separation in sports and, and athletes and artists, like, bros versus, like, yeah. nerds, right? Yeah. And I'm like, do you, first of all, do you realize how much, like creativity and thought and like planning and design go into being an athlete. Yeah. It's so graceful. Like watch Michael Jordan move yes. in the air. He's like a yeah. ballerina mm-hmm. who's yeah. jacked and six foot six. <laughs> but like playing sports a lot, seeing how you're expressing yourself through movement, mm-hmm. physically exerting yeah. energy, it's healthy for you. You use a lot of your mind to navigate and plan out stuff. It's very in the moment. It's improvisational a lot of the times, just like, how I play music. I play a lot of improvisational, experimental music and going to see improv jazz. Mm -hmm. There's so many similarities when you're maybe following a structure like a play, but within that play, you can't account for the other nine people and anomalies and the crowd Mm -hmm. and sweat and fatigue and time. So the same thing happens when you improv with music. Um, You're like, okay, we might play in the key of A. All right, you start out. And then after that, whatever happens, Mm -hmm. happens. And you kind of know how to ebb and flow based on bass, rhythm, melody, and the structure as far as like how long you've been going. But within that, you're doing it some type of improv like trans and it happens in sports too. Mm-hmm. There is a plan at, at hand, but with the in-between of that stuff can happen. You can't account for it. And mm-hmm. it's very creative, a lot more than I think people give it credit for. And then there's other things like the jerseys, the, the, the logos, there's a lot of design in them. You know, yeah. every couple of years, a new team changes their logo mm-hmm. and, it's cool. People talk about it. Oh, I don't like that design. It's like those are graphic designers and fashion designers making that yeah. happen. Like, I would always design our um, sweats, actually, for our oh, team. Really? Yeah, I had my <laughs> own little... I was trying to... I don't know. I didn't even realize it. I'm like, my creative self would always pop out. And now we have a <laughs> merchandise line for the organization. And mm-hmm. I'm like, wow, that was the birth of That's our awesome. merch. Yeah. That's but awesome. for me, I'm a visual artist. So like when I was playing, I was like, there's a rhythm to playing and it's really about like patterns and rhythm in order to be a good player Mm -hmm. and you have to use that same principle when you paint you know yes and i think like there's always disconnects with athletes that have never exposed themselves to creativity so then they just cut it out but i've been telling athletes all the time i'm like it's the same you know and if you observe it in that visual way then you'll understand how there's a connection Mm -hmm. um so yeah, I've been telling I would tell the Bulls that too. I'm like, look, there is a connection between art and basketball. I have so many ideas. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, all right, tell us your ideas. We're like, one of them, you need to host our kids and their showcase, you know. And so we were talking to a school right across the street from the United Center, and they mm-hmm. don't have a creative program, um, anything like ours, especially a photography program. And um, they were interested, but obviously funds were the restriction of us working with them. And um, the Bulls and Zenny Eyewear actually came together to support that program and host it at the East Atrium. So My favorite commercials. The oh, Zenny, Zenny ones? <laughs> with Io. <laughs> I know. Oh I was my like, God. I'm always cracking up when, when like watching a game and they pop up. I just started noticing them more after we started working with them. I'm like, wow, you guys really are everywhere. This is amazing. And their glasses are nice, actually. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm not a big sunglass person, but now I feel like I wear them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. So you've been able to piece together all the things you love in life. Yes. Isn't like, that remarkable? I know. It's a surreal feeling. You Don't you sometimes feel like bad and like (laughs) you almost feel like guilty and like imposter syndrome like this isn't fair that I'm having this much fun (laughs) like I like everything I do Mm. and it's a lot of work it's definitely a stressful balance because it's so 
you want to hold on to that because it's such a beautiful feeling. Mm -hmm. But then you you hear the negativity from maybe colleagues, friends, coworkers, whoever, uh, family about what they do and you're almost like you want to tell them like grab them by the the neck and just like just do, do what you your love thing. Yeah. like do your thing and yeah. it's daunting but like that's life life is daunting mm-hmm. like death is all around us like how about you live now because yeah. you don't know what's going to happen yeah so exactly. do what you love it could be anything it might not be an organization it might not be a professional athlete or a podcast but like find something mm-hmm. and just do it. it could be so simple it could be writing poetry in the morning it could yeah. be doing yoga, yeah. be going for a walk with your partner. It doesn't matter. Just yeah. do it. Yep. You know? Yeah, no, I think that's the truth of it is that life is very short. And what is, there's nothing else worth living and you don't really receive life if you're not working towards, you know, the things that you love, mm-hmm. whatever that may be. It doesn't have to be anything glamorous, but as long as it's in line with the things that you care about, that's the only way that you're creating a life worth living, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's how you're going to find things that also like align with you, right? Like I think the most fascinating lives I've met are people that are surrounded by other beautiful, fascinating people. And those are the rich moments in life. You know, you don't need fancy things or situations. If you have like rich minds around you that are just like challenging you to explore the world more deeply. Yeah. Um, I think that's what like pushes you to a different level of humanity and understanding of the world and that's what like, I get really excited about and so that's why I love going to art nights or there's always like thoughtful conversation and yeah I love traveling so yeah mm-hmm. where's the most recent place you've gone to um I haven't traveled as much as I usually travel over the past few years obviously COVID busy yes yeah. oh my gosh <laughs> surviving a pandemic with a organization that uh. year. <laughs> Short staffed on already. I know. Um, it was, yeah, a rough little <laughs> time, and I'm glad we overcame it and we are here today. But um, last place I went to, where was it? Maybe, I think LA was the last place I went to. Yeah. And what do you think about LA? Uh, you know, <laughs> it's for a certain type of folk. I mean, <laughs> that set it up. <laughs> well, I grew up going to LA because all my dad's side is from LA. Mm. So, very familiar with the LA traffic and like, just like, why do you sit in your car for most of the day? Like, I can't even deal with traffic here in Chicago. So like, yeah, what? Yeah. Like, that's just not my move. But New York, LA traffic is nuts. the worst. New York, I can handle a little better because at least I have the, you know, we have the train. Mm-hmm. That's true. And it's way more convenient than the L here. Although I'm not complaining about the L because it's way better than many cities, but Especially LA transport. Oh my God, it's absolutely it's terrible. It's like non existent. Yeah, right? it's not. Uh. And the ones that are, I'm just like, I need to get it over right now. <laughs> I need to get off of this thing. But um, yeah, I think that that place is just <laughs> interesting. I just need places where. Yeah, I like, know what kind of person you are. Because I'm the same <laughs> way. I have a really hard time saying like anything negative. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Like my friends are always like, I have friends who have to speak for me. <laughs> Or sometimes I just won't yeah, speak at all. Yeah, I have all. friends that are like that. They're like, just say it. And I'm like, no, it's cool. It's fine. <laughs> Do you think it's who you are and that's why you were in the position, the positions you're in? Or do you think it's from the work you do? Like being around kids and non-for-profits, you almost feel like you kind of sense yourself. Or does it come naturally? I think you have to be who you are in order to do this work. Right. If you're inauthentic about it, it's not, the work is only going to mold you so much. Right. It has to be like true to you in order for you to like be reciprocal with learning and giving to it. Right. So, I mean, if this wasn't really what I was about, you would have been able to see that very quickly. Yes. You know, I, I mean, you're out, your life's out in the open. You're always publicly doing stuff. Mm-hmm. You, it's to consuming your life. There's no, you know, obviously everyone has their own personal decompressing life they live, but yeah, I, I agree. It's, and I just don't like doing bad and negative things. I don't like putting that out there. It's, yeah. People make mistakes, and life's hard. I'm not going to sit there and be like, this person and that person. Mm-hmm. It's uncomfortable. It's not productive. Mm-hmm. What, 20 minutes later, you leave the conversation, like, sweating and upset that you were talking crap about someone for, <laughs> yeah. like, 20 minutes? Like, it's just not yeah. fun. It's no point. And so, you'll always get caught, too. You'll, yeah, always, get you'll caught. always get caught. you always get caught. And then you're like, why did I even do that? <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes I'll have, you know, friends who are a little bit more vicious just be like, what he, really, what he really means is this. I'm like, I ain't saying anything. I do this thing where I just 
don't confirm or deny anything. <laughs> and I was like, listen, it can't be held against me in a court of law. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> I mean, you know, I did play basketball, so I do talk a lot of smack if I have to. That's when it's I, fun, I, though. Yeah. That's when it's fun. Just like, I cannot imagine you just getting... <laughs> oh, I get into it. Everyone's like, simple good? Really? <laughs> <laughs> Simply like, insane. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, oh, this is a different topic, okay? <laughs> I'm the same way, too, the second... I put that Nike headband on. I know. And I'm dribbling a ball and I got shoes on. I'm like, I just go to places and it's just funny. It's is, fun though. Yeah, it's so much fun. And that's how you like connect to people too. The thing is I talk a lot of smack and I haven't played in a long time. So I'm just like, I have to kind of like back up at a certain point. They're like, really? I'm like, no, 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 no. We're not doing this right now. I'm not, I'm not playing. I'm not stepping on that court. Mm-hmm. It's almost like the more smack you talk, the less talented you are. Yeah. You got to compensate. You, you, you have to create compensate. a balance, you know? <laughs> but that's funny because that's kind of, in a, in a going to a dark path, um, a dark segue, the smack you hear on the internet, it's coming from a lot of people and you know, like who aren't quite, something's not right. I don't mm-hmm. know what it is. I can't really pinpoint it. I'm not going to generalize, but when someone's leaving that mean comment or messaging something that's not acceptable... Or just backhanding you like with a with a statement. It's I was like, what is? Why are you doing that? Like, I, if there's truly a problem, like, m- like email me. Maybe we should talk on the phone about it. Again, it's best to hear the person's voice. You can w- work through it. But I don't understand it. It's really weird. I think I, a lot of people, and this is a function of our society. We're not challenged to be nice to each other. Mm. We're actually provoked to be mean. Yeah, and those are like a very much of a testament through the art that is publicized on the radio or our TV shows, and you know things that are given the most attention are generally negative. And if we shifted that and actually said, you know, this is what our listen we listen to, this is what we accept on this platform, blah blah, blah then it enhances like a certain level of agreed upon morality. Mm-hmm. And we're such a young country that we haven't developed that yet. If you go to like a lot of ancient countries or even us older in general, there's some things that are accepted and there's just some things that aren't and everybody knows that and you have like a mutual respect around it. But in America, we don't have that established respect and we don't have a means to really even show that, you know, through our culture because we're still building the culture. Mm-hmm. It's a very young country. We're like the little baby of the of the world, you know, right. crying all the time. Like we're spoiled. We're like spoiled, spoiled. brats. We're young and rich. Yeah, like, as far as the grand scheme of the only you know, child. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> only child who's been spoiled, rich, and went to private schools her whole life. Yeah, like, exactly. Which this country really is like that, and doesn't even realize that we are actually the most impoverished country in the world, and we are very much closer to the third world country than we are our first really? world. Yeah, tw- over twenty five percent of the population is under the poverty line. Mm. And we don't even realize that. Yeah. And we look at other countries that are poor. I'm like, no, but we are poor. We have a lot of poverty. Yeah. And we don't even know how to manage it or handle it. And we've never even tried to create a sustainable solution towards it. We rather just remove ourselves from it and create separation between wealth and disparity. Yeah. And I I think that we're just naive about what our identity is still because we're, one, not trying to face it. We're still in the, whatever, childhood years. (laughs) Teenagers. Eventually we're going to enter into like teenage and it's going to be a mess. Maybe this was a teenage year. I don't know. But the identity piece of this country is still in flux. And that's why I think we haven't even, um, we, those types of comments are something that can happen all over the world. But in America, it's just like bewildering almost, you know? It is. It is. <laughs> I don't know anybody in my circle that would say these types of things. Right. And then you just look at them and we accept it too. Like, yep, well, this is America. Like, <laughs> It's it's weird. It's sad. I mean, I can't imagine a life when it doesn't happen. I would love for it to be a lot more peaceful on the internet, and not so like a competition. Yeah, we're a little. I mean, it's natural to be competitive as a species, mm-hmm. but it gets. We're smarter than that. We have a. We're very wise, and we should be more uh, on top of that. But mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, this country is weird. It's it has so <laughs> much strength and so much. Wealth, and then it has, yeah, you can go over a couple blocks and you're like, someone lives in that home or that apartment or that warehouse or on the street next to, you know, a high rise. It's confusing. It's truly confusing. And I don't know, I try to, I'm trying to find my way to do something about it, but it, it's strength in numbers. It's like we need a lot more people. 
yeah. and on it, you know. But that's the gratefulness that I'm sure you feel that I feel when you see it click in other people, other adults that come along for the ride and they're like, yeah, I actually want to do this. You inspired me to do this, this, and that. And I'm sure you get those messages or emails. I get them and they, the one bad comment you got on something when you get just the one good one. It, for me, I try to let it outweigh it. A lot of people focus on the negative, but it's remarkable. Mm-hmm. Some of the things people say, just, you know, you inspired me or thank you for this or I'm trying to do that now and now I want to make this mural or go on this tour. I made a record because of you or you inspired me to go follow my dream in college. I was going to go do this major and now I'm doing That's this major. That's amazing. Those are the great yes. things. I'm sure you've received those too. I'm sure kids, after working with them all these years, they get older, they go on to high school and college. I'm sure you get those messages. Yeah. And those are the things that make you, that gratefulness you spoke of, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, it's very humbling. I mean, I think that a lot of the times you do make a larger impact on people than you realize and the likelihood of you actually finding out is pretty low, right? Mm-hmm. And that's why we have to also be mindful when we do um, with all our actions, even if it's negative. Just because no one says anything doesn't mean somebody didn't feel it. Right. And so for us to be conscious human beings is very critical in order for us to create peaceful societies. You know, people think that, oh, I can just do something and it's not a big deal. I'm like, somebody's seeing it. Mm-hmm. And it is going to impact them depending on where they are at. And the likelihood of you finding out might be low, right? Because we don't actually know the footprint we leave on other people. And when we do find out, it is very humbling because it takes a level of courage for somebody to do that. But that's why, like, because we know that, we have to be mindful of everything that we do, right? And being good all the time. Because whether you think it or not, people are watching, right? Yeah. And are being impacted by your energy. Now they're really watching. <laughs> yeah, seriously. It is. Everything's filmed. Sometimes it's exhausting. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. some of my favorite places to go are just, like, go sit on the couch, put on a record, maybe have some wine. And just relax and, you know, but that's like a sacred place because life is so public now, meeting people, going around, doing things like this. People can see this now mm-hmm. and, which is fine, but it's like, it definitely can push you inward a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I think you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like take privacy very seriously because of that. And no, oh, the internet's, it's a weird place. Mm-hmm. And it's definitely, it's different for men and women for sure. But yeah, I don't know. I I just I really love to see the impact on just one person or ten, especially when you see it in kids because we were all kids once, mm-hmm. and you know there, there was always that one kid in class around the neighborhood that everyone was like, oh, that it's not good language, but like oh that kid's bad or that kid's crazy or like ignore that person. Mm-hmm. It's like, but now being able to inspire that who that kid could be to other people yeah. and could change their life from maybe not going to school or ending up in prison or committing crimes or hurting themselves till like now they found something they love. Mm-hmm. One little switch, one little road less taken. Yeah. It's remarkable. It's and and it's similar. not just people like you and I could do it. Everyone could do yes. it. Like every person can literally do it every day of your life. Mm-hmm. Where, it's just so know, simple. Wear a I'm, smile. Yeah. Just be less grumpy yeah. for one day. Mm-hmm. And the barista, the bank teller, the, the person in the in the line at the store can be like that much happier because of that. Yeah. It was really this the simple things, honestly. <laughs> like we don't need much to make us happy. No. We are just very simple beings. And I think like this whole um, you know, materialism world that we live in is super it's a very false pretense of like what really makes us happy because no matter what beautiful thing that you have, it's really those small moments that just like live with you. You mm-hmm. know? I remember when I um was working in corporate and I was not happy with my job. I was spending so much money. Oh my god! Every time you talk about yeah. it, you like twitch. Your eyes flitter. Like I was just flutter. like, did I really do that for a significant period of my life? Why is it that when? Okay, Come on, I want to hear what you have to say, but why is it that when anybody talks about corporate, even people who are in it, they don't like it? It's like that word. People like seek for the prestige and the money mm-hmm. and everything that comes with it. But they like don't even like uttering it. Yeah. What? Yeah. So I'm, I'm in my head, I go, then why'd you, not you, because you got out of it, but like, why are you doing that? Yeah. Like, oh, you, you know, you don't want to do this. It's, you know, it's corporate. You wouldn't like it. It's like, then why are you doing it? You mm. clearly don't like it. You have this negative tone when you talk about it. I is mean, it, is it really a, money? Just pays you off? I think it is money. It's <laughs> an easy pathway. It's security. That's what people want sometimes, you know, to 
pursue other goals. Lame. <laughs> it's not for everybody. That's all I can say. Yeah, so. it certainly is not. Um, but yeah, even when I was there, I was like feeling um, not fulfilled, obviously. <laughs> I was getting paid, so I would be spending it more. And I did try to value like those material things because what's the point of doing all this like meaningless hard work if you can't reap some reward? And I guess the reward is that now I could buy fancy things and yeah, I'll do that. And then you buy it and then you realize... Well, that was anticlimactic. I don't actually need this thing at all, you know? Yeah. And as soon as I um, left my job to do Simple Good full, full time, I think my brother observed, he's like, wow, she, uh, I think, I don't even know how he saw my credit card bill, but it went like immediately in half. Like, <laughs> and I didn't even realize it actually. <laughs> it went in my credit card. Yeah. I don't even know how he saw it, but it was half and I didn't even realize it. It wasn't something that was intentional. It mm-hmm. was just that I was filling up my time with something that was meaningful. So it l- didn't lead me to have time to spend it on these things or even think about it. Yeah. I was already getting like, my cup was full and I didn't need to get all this stuff. A lot of the times when you do value you know these types of material things it's because something's missing Mm -hmm. you know and i realized that very quickly like i don't need things you know i have and then when you're in the right path you're going to get the things that you need you know Mm -hmm. so yeah i think like we're kind of taught that we need these things and that's why we have to make a ton of money and that's why we have to get these fancy jobs and it's really just you're gonna get the money that you need when you're doing the right thing that's for you it's way more about the experience Mm -hmm. yeah and the people the money thing it's i always say like i've never had money i don't even know what money is anymore i'm Mm -hmm. just like i just want to be happy and do what i love and i do that but you know and then obviously people who don't have like oh well easy for you to say like I have like absolutely nothing. I'm like, yeah, there are some basic things, but like that's what I'm working towards. People do need shelter, mm-hmm. they need food, they need water, they need clothes on their back. Everyone should have that. That's it's sad that some people don't. Mm-hmm. But then there's those who just keep their bank account just keeps going up, and they. And for those, they need to donate to the Simple Good. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> donate to Simple Good and DZ Records. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. I I always say if I was like ever really really rich like a billionaire I'd have so much fun yeah oh same my, like with money like I would go like to a bar buy like one drink and leave like a ten thousand dollar tip <laughs> and just like yeah. walk away and not say anything just fun stuff like I'd go to a kid and be like you need a new computer yeah go walk in the apple and just buy them like ten and be like here you go and walk away why don't people with money do these things it's like do something fun give money back start an organization donate it like you you can't die with this, I mean, you die and it's gone. It can go to whoever, but like, let them figure it out. Like, yeah. you know, you can definitely help your kids out, but they need to make their own way too. Mm-hmm. People should do more with their money. I don't understand it. Yeah, but I'm always um, actually against people buying things mm. in order to give back. It's oh, more okay. so like investing in people's well being and their education because mm-hmm. you could always buy things and then it will go away. That's true. And if you can help investing in developing someone's mind so that they can go in the pathway that's true to them, that's how they're going to be a benefit to society. Like scholarships, things like that. Yeah. Like, you know, just even like our, our schools are not funded. This is so crazy. Oh, We're in a first yeah. world country <laughs> and these schools are not funded. And it's not about buying the school things. It's about getting them the resources so the staff is happy. You're getting an infrastructure that's safe. And you're getting food that's proper, right? And Mm -hmm. that's what's going to create the development of the children in there so that they can actually move on as functional human beings one day. But the thing is, is like these basic investments in people and their well-being isn't even there. It's just more so buying stuff. Yeah. And like what is stuff if you can't really even properly use it? Like a lot of times the schools I see, I see so many things donated to them like computers and cameras and stuff and it's just locked up collecting dust because mm-hmm. nobody knows how to use them. Yeah. So what is that really going to do, right? We need to invest in the brain rather than these things. Why why don't schools have better investments? Like we're aware of it. I we all went through the school system. I saw how bad it is especially when it comes to the arts, but in general, yeah, if you're an educator and you're not valued, I, I don't know if you would say underpaid, but just not valued properly, it's a job. So like, you're maybe not going to put a lot into it because you're like, well, screw this. Like they're not going to take care of me. I'll just do my thing, work my nine months, have summers off, do 30 years and get out. And it's not good. Like these people are responsible. I teach full time. I'm responsible for these people's lives and future. And we have problems in my department at a university all the time with not having funding. And you know, it's, 
it's so sad, like to be again, like you said, in this beautiful country, first world country, every culture is here in all 50 states. It's amazing. It's remarkable. And we're aware of it. And yet we're not funding it. I, I don't get it. The money has to be there in the federal and state government. Like It has to be. It just has to be allocated properly. I don't know. I don't know why. Yeah. I don't think it's an issue of enough money. Right. It's just about the values of who we put in leadership. Like a lot of people that are in positions of power don't value some of these things, right? And so if it's not a part of them and connected to them, naturally their decision making is going to be aligned to what they're connected to. And I think that if there's a community and there's a need, you got to bring in the right people that are doing this and you got to have a right support system around them, right? Like I think Chicago is a great example of the politics in play of very it's very clear what communities are in need. And then you got decision makers that are not invested in those needs, Mm -hmm. you know. And so how do we really develop more people that feel connected in investing in across all our communities? That's what we need. Like, you know, even if you're doing community impact work, not everybody's really connected to community, unfortunately, Mm -hmm. you know. And we try to think that that's the truth. But if we really want that to be the case, then we need to really look at who are we putting in the place to make these decisions and challenge them when it's not the infrastructure isn't there. I think we can be very complacent as community members sometimes of like, oh yeah, that community is, it's whatever. No, we need to stand up against all of our communities. Like, why is that community suffering and mine's okay? Like, you know, we don't mm-hmm. get that advocacy um, for each other. We're just like for us. Mm-hmm. And I think that's also what creates a different dynamic of power that allows certain communities to get less and some communities to get more. Mm-hmm. And I think the shortcut of getting people not to feel less guilty is to buy things. It shouldn't be buying things. It should be investing in the infrastructure so things are sustainable. Mm-hmm. That camera's going to die in three years, right? right. And no one's going to use that camera if no one knows how to use it. Mm-hmm. So you this just, neighborhood could be here for 100 years. Yes, and like years. you just, uh, basically what happens is uh, there's actually a theory around it. I forgot what it's called, but it's like a, it's a, it's a tactic to release guilt mm. by buying things that don't really matter. Because we all know the especially Chicago knows the science behind connecting and evolving human beings and know that this is a very diverse city and there's a power in unity. And that's why it was purposely constructed in the way it was, which is segregation. And the tactics that were used to segregate it was to eliminate power from communities so that you don't have a unified community. That means that you can really have control over everybody. You know, when people are unified, the strength is huge. Right. When they're divided, that's how you create injustice. And so that tactic is still being used right now. And right now in Chicago, we don't feel connected to each other, right? And that's why this segregation still exists. If we really wanted to invest in unity, that could have been done a very long time ago. You know, all the buildings that we build all the time, really, like I know, we can build them anywhere, and we don't even need buildings actually for this for what we need. We need to invest in why are there certain places of under resources, and that's naturally going to lead a human be- being to go in a devastating place. We already know that, right? Like everything that's happening, we can't look at human beings and be like, why? Why are you like that? What we should be looking at is like. What happened, right? You're not born into this earth with suffering. Mm-hmm. So we have created resources to lead to that suffering. Yeah. And how come we haven't changed it, it, the trajectory of this human being? You know, when you go to Europe, well, there's so many people from Europe that travel here, and they're just like, you guys don't even, like, take care of everybody? Like, everyone's not promised a doctor? Like, mm-hmm. you don't even have proper roads? <laughs> you know, know what I mean? It's just like... It's awful. Yeah, we're just so behind in just these basic needs that we have to provide to everybody. Mm -hmm. I I don't, trust me, you're you're hitting the nail on the head (laughs) and I couldn't agree more. What you're saying is what I go on about all the time. I go on about it to my friends on this podcast, to other people. I'm like, it's right there. You could see it when you drive. Mm -hmm. I would deliberately not take I-55 or 994 and just drive through the neighborhoods to see like how catastrophic sometimes this is. And it's right there. And then, yeah, you look over and you see another big high rise. I can see the crane right there, another yeah. one. I'm like, 
Of course. Who is living there? There's there's actually a mass exodus of Chicago right now, so I don't know why more buildings are being built, especially residential. Because well, you know, it makes more money than putting it into the infrastructure, which in the long run, I oh. think that makes more money. It's a fast condo complex, mm-hmm. you know, for mm-hmm. people who could afford that much money. But yeah. I would argue that you'd make more money if everyone is doing well, because yeah. that's more longevity wise. If you want a quick buck in the next five years, yeah, build a condo complex yeah. in downtown Chicago. Mm-hmm. If you want. Uh, the whole economic rise for the next 50 years invest in every neighborhood, yeah, you know? But exactly. some people don't like that long game. Uh, they don't see it come back to them in their lifetime, you know? They want to get they want to get reelected. They want to be on some board and they don't, it takes too long to do mm-hmm. that, you know? But it's... Yeah, I mean, everybody wants like a quick turnaround and immediate impact and all that stuff, but it's just not the trajectory of humans' work. We no. do not react and change quickly. It takes and therefore, a long time. yeah, we have to just understand that's a function. Sorry, Casey's texting. It's okay. She's like, probably get out of my apartment. <laughs> We're almost, we, you said you have to be done in f- at 5 15. Mm-hmm. So, unless like, she leave kick- here at 5 15? Yeah, okay. unless she kicks us out earlier. Oh, we'll do a couple her. more minutes. Okay, cool. Um, well, when do you run for mayor? When do I vote? How do I vote for you? <laughs> Never. <laughs> right? Oh Who God. wants these jobs? <laughs> these jobs yeah. are insane. Like, public officials. It's funny. Whoever. So, you are the right person. You just said never. <laughs> That's the type, right? The type of people that should be public officials, the ones who don't want to do it. That really, it should almost be. Is that be what it is? Oh my I gosh. think so because the people who want to do it, I think something got to screw loose. Something's not right. Yeah. Ego gets too big when you want that type of power. Like you're seeking it. An impossible job, first of all. Like who could actually just be the person that's the name or face of a whole city, a state, a country? Mm-hmm. It sounds insane to me. But I don't know. I don't have an answer for that one. It's a really strange system. Yeah. I mean,. I don't know. I don't have an answer either. <laughs> like, I'm not even going to jump into that, especially with Chicago. Oh, my God. I know. You're like, I got five like, minutes left. I can't jump into Chicago politics. Well, I don't even think in, there's any designated time that can, like, really Years summarize to talk about it. what is going on over here. My it's God. It's crazy, right? And I was, um, what was it? Like, May 20th, I was going to Orchestra Hall with a friend to see my friend Thaddeus Tukes play. And we leave the parking lot over on Monroe in Michigan by the Art Institute. And bam, 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 six gunshots, 100 feet from me. It was like two nights after the other shooting there when they put in the curfew. And I see police officers running. Uh, a woman police officer was running past me with her gun out and just tells us to just run. Oh, my God. Yeah. What? And I'm with someone who's from a different country, and she's, like, freaking out. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is terrible. And it just to be – it's not the first time I've heard gunshots, but to be that close – in Millennium Park, this is a tourist attraction. So it's anywhere, really. But it's like, why is this happening? Like, we need, there's so much. We need, like, five more hours on this podcast. To keep Don't even about. get me started on guns in uh, this country. Oh, my <laughs> God. Like, are you joking? Like, we're just, oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's just such common sense that it should not be so easy to have a firearm. Mm-hmm. Like, come on. We cannot be so lost in politics that we're, willing for so many people to be reckless and die right just because we're trying to make money like this is literally just insane that we are just show this is our example to the world it's right. embarrassing whenever it's embarrassing. i travel i'm just like i'm not from Chicago. I'm, not, I'm not from america i'm not from i'm not american just don't actually. speak <laughs> yeah, no. like, you're not from america cuz <laughs> now we are just like so fascinating whenever we travel they just look at us like wow with you people how 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 do you live there like <laughs> i I try not to uh, like put everyone into one category when I meet people from other places. Like if I met someone from Russia, I wouldn't be like, w-, I'd be like, you're just a citizen. You probably don't even like what's going on. And it's the same thing here. It's like, yeah, I live here. I'm grateful for the freedom we have. Mm-hmm. Um, it's amazing. I've only been able to do what I do because of this freedom. But I also am still upset with how we're doing things. And yeah, and yeah it's not even just like how easy it is to get guns legally. The people who are buying them or getting them illegally like that's a whole nother issue why are they even forced into that well let's think well they have to get it illegally because they're probably an ex-felon why are they an ex-felon why do we brand ex-felons why do we put this f on their forehead they can't get a right job they can't get right funding they can't get maybe a business loan or student loans anymore or at least not good ones 
They can't buy a fire. They can't do so many things. They can't vote. They can't vote, which is, doesn't make any sense to me. But so we just pretty much took away like their American soul because well, it's a legacy of slavery. It, yeah, it's yeah. ridiculous. It's don't even get me started on that. It <laughs> just drives me crazy. Our prison system is so bad. It's so bad. I mean, our criminal system. It's all just a function of upholding capitalism. Yeah. Like, even during the pandemic, when we had a lot of protests. Prisons were not making as much money, and they literally had to come together to figure out how they were going to get more money because they make money on a per head basis. Uh. So there's an incentive to keep people enslaved, and then you ruin the rest of their lives, and then you actually don't create more peaceful societies because you have a very unhappy traumatized person into society with no training of how to reintegrate into society. So what do you expect is going to happen? And it's not like they don't know what they're doing. They're doing this on purpose. And it's like the most tragic thing that we're allowing the system to take place. If Mm -hmm. you could actually take even half those human beings that are locked up and make them into functional citizens, if you look at the economy of it, we could actually be way more of a thriving market than we are. Yeah, But we are creating circumstances that make this a less peaceful country by dehumanizing people as a business. And that's literally what's happening. Yeah. And we are actually the largest slaveholders in the entire world. Slavery is the largest it's ever been in the history of the world. And now most of it is in South Asian countries and mostly women and children. Mm. So if you look at like Americans and our cheap clothes and fast fashion, those are all done by these labor shops that are getting paid nothing, and we control their economic vitality because of our military all around the world. So those types of same types of strategies to keep people down for our economic benefit happens here too, you know? We went to some places right before we end. (laughs) (laughs) I agree with everything you said, and it makes it very difficult to purchase materials. I, I overthink it. I, I go, I mean, I'll spend more money to make sure it's properly sourced or recycled or made in a certain country where I know it was done well. That's why it's $100 instead of 20 things like that. Yeah. But it's like, I, don't, I can't even, it's too expensive to live that way too. It's, they make it, it's a quagmire. You're damned if you do, damned if you don't. It's mm-hmm. like, yeah, you, if you have a lot of money, you can really live, you can buy the right vegetables and meat and it's freshly sourced. You can grow it. You can have enough land to do it. But like not everyone can live that mm-hmm. way. Yeah, and then yeah, you have these smartphones and these heavy metals. How are we getting them? I don't even think about it. it drives mm-hmm. me crazy. We complain about them on platforms where the materials to complain about them are used to make them. It's like such a weird, yeah. Like I don't know. Yeah, we have a long way to go, <laughs> but it's important for us to have like some self awareness of how we function in that system, and you know, buy less, buy ethically. Just realize we don't need more. Right. And if Mm -hmm. we can also have that mindset, if we don't need more, it actually cuts a lot of these businesses and systems that uses human labor to feed our hunger for more. Right. And so I think that's like, you know, one of our goals that we should take away is like, do I really need all these things? No. Mm -hmm. Do I need all these clothes? No. You know, Mm -hmm. just being intentional with how we purchase things and understand like that will eventually have a ripple effect on how a lot of these businesses that are human hurting human beings will actually thrive. Right. Well, it takes having the conversation. Yes, definitely. Getting uncomfortable, hearing what else someone has to say and their experience. Mm -hmm. So thank you for sharing your life with me and um, and those listening. It's really remarkable. Thank You're you. doing great things. Thank you. It's nice to see people do it and do it well and do it with true passion, mm-hmm. true drive. You could tell. It's very genuine and inspiring. So thank you, and thank you for doing this. I yeah, really appreciate thanks it. thanks for having me, Ben. And, yeah, I hope that we can create some more change together. So. I, agree, I agree. And you have my vote. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for my future non-office uh, yeah, campaign. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank awesome. you very much. Thank you. Take care. Let me tell Casey she can have her apartment. <laughs> <laughs> we did it.